I've actually never s given a talk before about my work on Huawei and Z ZTE. So th this is the first thing. It, usually, you know, you, you want impact on a story. Generally, you hope it doesn't take five or six years, but I'll, 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 I'll take it whatever every way I can get it. This was almost like a Christmas present for me. Um, anyway, I like to say as a journalist, you're, you're only as good as your next story, um, particularly as an investigative reporter. Um, but I do think the story I did about Huawei CFO and um, an Iranian company called Skycom Tech Co. Limited that had tried to violate U.S. sanctions, that that might be a rare exception. It was published six years ago next week. Um, and until recently, I'd pretty much forgotten all about it. Um, now, I'd like to tell you about my experiences writing about that story and the other stories I did about ZTE and, and um, Huawei. Um, just, I think it would provide some historical context to um, you know, what's become this in incredible international news event. I mean, even today there was a story about Canada and a person who had been convicted of drug smuggling, gotten 15 years, and now, now he's gotten the, the de death, death sentence. But we, we can talk about s some of that in the question and answer period. Um, so I first wrote about Huawei back in 2011 when I was at the Wall Street Journal. Um, I, I oversaw a series of stories, we called it Censorship Inc. It was about how autocratic regimes during the Arab Spring were using um, Western and Chinese um, technology to crack down on dissidents and their own citizens. And towards the end of that series, towards the end of 2011, several colleagues and I wrote a story about Huawei and how it had signed a contract to become a um, to provide Iran's largest mobile phone operator with equipment that allowed police to track the location of people on, on their cell phones. Um, now the story noted that nearly all countries, if not all of them, require police access to phone net net networks, in including the United States. But, but as the story said, quote, the difference is that in the hands of repressive regimes, it can be a critical tool in helping to quash dissent. Now, the story revealed something else, too, which was that Huawei had made a pitch that year to Iranian government officials to sell equipment for a mobile news service, like on, on your phone, um, to Iran's second largest mobile phone operator. And, and, and in the story, we, we said that according to a person who had attended this meeting, that Huawei representatives emphasized that being from China, they had expertise censoring the news. And Huawei won that contract, and, and the operator rolled out that service. Now, I was reminded of that story recently, not because of the arrest of Huawei's CFO, but, but before that, I learned that a guy named William Plummer, he's an American who had worked for Huawei as its vice president of external affairs in Washington for quite a few years, that he had self-published a book about Huawei and his, ex his experiences there. This is not a bestseller. Um, a colleague told me I'd better buy it because I'm actually in it. So I did. Um, it turns out the, the book doesn't actually name me, but it becomes clear who, who Plummer's referring to when he quotes from a blog post that he had published on January 1st, 2013 that I, I don't remember ever seeing. And the Post said that, quote, a major newswire investigative reporter has attempted to spin fantastical tales of China-based multinationals either supporting Iranian government suppression of its citizens or circumventing U.S. export controls to provide embargoed telecommunications or computing equipment to Iran. And he referred to the Wall Street Journal front page story this way, the, the one I had just spoken about. He said, in late 2011, the reporter wove a whole ridden cloth of a story. While his misinformed article did run, it did so with little traction, and it seems the reporter came to realize that his story was full of holes. Talk about fake news. 
What the story, what his book fails to mention is that six weeks after the Wall Street Journal story came out, Huawei suddenly announced it was scaling back its business in Iran, citing what it called increasingly complex situation there. And our story reported that Huawei executives had actually talked about doing this for some time, um, for several months, but that this, these discussions had gained an intensity after our, our, our story came out. Um, and by the way, so I, we did a story reporting that Huawei had announced it was going to cut back its business in Iran. Um, and in that story, which I just read in preparation for, for this talk, it had two paragraphs sort of in, in the middle of it. And it was about another Huawei-related company. And, and I'll just read you what it said. The size of Huawei's business in Iran remains unclear and tracking it is difficult, in part because it sometimes works through a Hong Kong registered company with a different name, Skycom Tech Co. Limited. Employees of Huawei and Skycom say the companies are closely affiliated. Although William Plummer, Huawei's Vice President of External Affairs in Washington, said Huawei doesn't, quote, have any investment, unquote, in Skycom, he said Huawei had, quote, had some cooperation with them in the past on commercial projects, unquote. And then the next paragraph said, an employee at an accounting firm listed in Skycom's Hong Kong records said Huawei owned the company but declined to answer questions. A former Skycom employee who worked in the Treasury Department in Tehran said reports were sent daily to the company's headquarters in China, which was, quote, was the exact same as Huawei's in China. In February 2012, I, I left the Wall Street Journal. I began working for Reuters. So partly, it was a chance to move back to London, wh which I really love living in. And, um, and Reuters, if you don't know, is the world's largest international multimedia news provider. Um, I didn't realize I'd become known as an investigative wire service reporter, but apparently that's happened. Um, so almost immediately, I began writing about another Chinese telecommunications network equipment company that was doing business in Iran. And that was called ZTE. And so this was, in effect, kind of a continuation of the work I had, I had, I had been doing, doing at the journal. And the first story I did, which ran in March of 2012, um, was in some ways very similar to the the, the story a few months earlier about Huawei in Iran. The, the headline was, Chinese firm helps Iran spy on citizens. And it disclosed that ZTE had sold Iran's largest telecom firm a powerful surveillance system capable of monitoring landline, mobile, and internet communications. To me, this was actually worse than selling something that could track location, because this could literally my, the, this involved a filtering system that everything go, going through the internet like could be intercepted and, and, and monitored. Um, but interestingly enough, that story, it wasn't, when people refer to that story today, they never talk about that, about that they had provided this, this surveillance system. What they talk about was something that I put in, what, what, I don't know, the third or fourth paragraph, which said that, that the system, that the documents that, that I saw, involving this system, also disclose a backdoor way Iran apparently obtains U.S. technology despite a long-time American ban on non-humanitarian sales to Iran by purchasing them through a Chinese company. A 907-page packing list from 2011 included hardware and software products from some of America's best-known tech companies, including Microsoft Corporation, Hewlett Packard Company, Oracle Corporation, Cisco Systems Inc., Dell Inc., Juniper Networks Inc., and Symantec Corporation. Now, the, I told you that Huawei took like, uh, I don't know, a few weeks after the journal story to, to actually react. CTE literally took like, a few hours, which to me sh showed the power of Reuters, particularly o overseas. The day, literally the next day, a, a spokesman said the company would curtail its business in Iran. And the company later issued a statement saying, ZT no longer seeks new customers in Iran and limits business activities with existing customers. Um, as you'll see, that wasn't quite what 
happened. Um, now, as for Mr. Plummer, the author, he seems for the first time to have liked one of my stories. Quote, by seemingly all accounts, he wrote in his book, it was a legitimate and important story. So he liked the ZT one, the Huawei one, something else. Um, my ZT story and a follow-up one about another attempt to violate U.S. sanctions quickly sparked federal investigations of the company. And I, I remember meeting with an investigator from the U.S. government, and I asked him, how long is it going to take? And we did a story saying they were investigating, and he said it would take a while. And as it turned out, it took four years. Um, and, and by the way, this was during the, the Obama administration. This wasn't, you know, there was no talk of trade wars or an, anything like that. So in March of 2016, I remember I got a phone call from some source saying, I think we're going to have something for you. And I said, oh, like, what is it? And he said, well, uh, it involves something you're, you'd be interested in. And I said, well, does it involve an, any letters I could guess? And he, he, he just laughed, and they wouldn't tell me. But then, um, you know, when they could tell me, they did. So the Commerce Department um, found that ZT had violated sanctions on Iran by selling U.S. goods. And, and it, told, it ordered that, that ZT couldn't buy anymore without obtaining a special license from the U.S. government. And again, remember, this was under Obama. Um, but this requirement was later lifted temporarily, and, it, and they kept um, doing this sort of over and over again. Then a year later, in March of 2017, ZT pl pleaded guilty to, in U.S. federal court in Texas, where it, where it had an office, um, for conspiring to violate U.S. sanctions by illegally shipping U.S. goods and technology to Iran. And at that time, it agreed to pay $892 million in fines and penalties, and an additional penalty of $300 million if it didn't comply with its agreement with the Commerce Department over the next seven years. And I remember telling a friend of mine, I wish I had been, in, like, not a journalist, but like a, filed a whistleblower complaint so I could have gotten a piece of that. But um, anyway. Um, so that, that was what happened in March of 2017. And in its announcement, the Justice Department noted the role of my ZTE story um, and how the, the company had responded by claiming it would, as I said, would curtail its business. Only it didn't. Um, by 2014, ZT was not only continuing to do business in Iran, but it was continuing to ship U.S. equipment to Iran in violation of sanctions. And it continued to do so up until 2016. Quote, Z, this is from the Justice Department, ZT Corporation not only violated our export control laws, but once caught, shockingly resumed illegal shipments to Iran during the course of our investigation. ZT Corporation then went to great lengths to devise elaborate corporate-wide schemes to hide its illegal conduct, including lying to its own lawyers. And these lawyers had made presentations to the um, U.S. government that, you know, that ZT had stopped doing this, and, and th it turns out that, you know, they hadn't. Um, then last April, the Commerce Department banned ZT from buying U.S. parts at all uh, after it turned out the company had failed on an another score. Um, they had promised in that settlement agreement to punish some of the employees who were responsible, only in, it turns out they didn't. So, um, and that action, uh, you may remember, because it wasn't that long ago, it looked like it was going to put ZT at, at a business. I mean, the stock stopped trading. Um, all these, um, y you know, the, the company just said they, you know, they didn't think they'd be able to, to, to stay in business. And then, then suddenly someone stepped in out of the blue and rescued them, and that was President Trump, um, which he said he did as a favor to to the president of China. So the ban was lifted, but it wasn't that ZT got off scot-free. It agreed to pay another billion dollars fine on, on, on top of the earlier $892 million. So let's, um, let's get back to Huawei. In back in December 2012, I wrote a story about Skycom, and it documented how it had offered to sell at least 1.3 million euros worth of embargoed Hewlett-Packard computer equipment to Iran's largest mobile phone operator in late 
2010. The documents showed that at least 13 pages of, of the proposal to, to sell that U.S. equipment were marked Huawei Confidential and carried the Huawei's company logo. Now, I talked to Huawei, and they said that, that Skycom was one of its major local partners. Um, and it also said that the deal had never happened, which, to be clear here, I, I've never... Um, proved that Huawei has violated U.S. sanctions. What I wrote was that Skycom, which Huawei <laughs> was closely tied to, had, had attempted um, to violate sanctions, that Skycom had. Huawei denied it. I, is that true? I, I honestly don't know. But I, I, again, I want to be clear. I've never written a story that, that, that proved that Huawei had violated sanctions. My stories did show that ZTE had, and, um, and, and I also did stories on other companies that year, in, including a South African company called M MTN, and how it, it had violated sanctions. So um, anyway, so that story about Skycom, and really just only about Skycom, noted the even more close links. Remember I mentioned that an earlier story had talked about how if someone who'd worked in the Treasury office said that they had to file reports to the same head office in China that, that Huawei had. Um, that story for Reuters said that it, it reported that Iranian, that I found an Iranian job recruitment site that describes Skycom using the same language Huawei used on one of its websites. Um, and, and it also, um, note, that story noted that on LinkedIn, I found former employees for, well not just former, but employees who had worked for, um, worked in Iran, in which they said on their CVs they had worked at Huawei-Skycom. And that an ex, and that an ex-Skycom employee said that two companies say, ha, had shared the same headquarters in, in, in China. So in his book, Plummer talks about that story. He said it limped along based on mirrors but no smoke. And he further suggested that referring to the confidential Huawei documents in that bidding contract was a blatant and intentional misrepresentation, since it wouldn't be unusually said or shocking for a Huawei partner to draw from Huawei documents for a bid proposal. He also said that, that I had clearly telegraphed my intent to pursue a personal, long-term, prejudicial windmill tilt at China-based companies. Well, it's funny, because the last time I checked, and Jonathan mentioned some of this, Facebook, Citibank, Apple, Microsoft, Dole, the fruit company, and numerous other companies that I've investigated over the years weren't based in China. So this claim that, y you know, I, I only expose Chinese companies is complete nonsense. Um, so at the end of January 2013, I wrote a follow-up story to the one I'd done at the end of the year about Skycom. And this was the headline, exclusive, Huawei CFO linked to firm that offered HP gear to Iran. And that story revealed even closer ties between Huawei and Skycom, including the fact that Meng Wanzhou, Huawei's CFO and the daughter of its founder, Ren Zhengfei, had served on Skycom's board between February 2008 and April 2009. Now, if you looked at the Hong Kong registry records for Skycom, you learned that in November 2007, all of its shares were transferred to a company that was registered in Mauritius called Canicula Holdings. So, and to this, and then if you continue to look at the Skycom records up until 2017, you see that Canicula um, which until last week no one knew anything about, um, uh, owned all of Skycom's shares. So in fact, Skycom ostensibly was sold in November 2007, but the CFO joins Skycom's board like after, after that. Um, now as we all know, Canadian authorities arrested Ms. Meng last month while she was changing planes in Vancouver, and it, it set off an international furor that, as we know, ha hasn't abated. Um, now the charges against her, and she's out on bail, 
have not been made public. They, there's, they haven't released like an indictment or anything like that. But, but there are many documents that were filed um, in court in Canada um, in, for her bail hearing, which lasted se several days. And I, I've read all those documents. And um, interestingly, they make clear that she's not being accused of v violating sanctions. Rather, she's basically accused of lying to banks about my stories. That's particularly that story that I wrote. Um, according to the, so, and this was total news to me, right? I mean, like, I had moved on to many different projects. Um, but according to the documents, several banks, one of them was clearly HSBC, questioned Huawei about, about my articles after they were published. And in responding to the banks, they say that Meng and other Huawei employees repeatedly lied about the company's relationship with Skycom and failed to disclose that, quote, Skycom was entirely controlled by Huawei. Um, I don't know if you saw that she, she met with a bank executive um, in, I believe, around August of 2013 and gave a PowerPoint presentation. <coughs> and, um, in which she discusses like being on the board and why sh why sh she was on the board, um, and and then the bank asked. It was in Chinese though, so the bank asked for an English translation of that, which she, she you know which was then provided by Huawei. But but she's the one who like ha had this meeting, and once again, um, the the you know she maintained that Skycom was you know like. Not the same, not the same as Huawei. And these court documents allege that, in fact, they are the same. And not only that, they allege that Canicula was also part of Huawei as well. And um, I did this story uh, last week, which showed that Huawei was doing business through Canicula in Syria, which was hadn't been hadn't been known before. Um, anyway. Getting back to the, the Meng case, it, as a result of, the, of, the, of her deception, the, the court documents allege that the, these banks unwittingly cleared hundreds of millions of dollars of transactions that potentially violated economic sanctions Washington in place, had, had in place at the time against doing business with Iran. Now, you have to remember HSBC was under a, like a court agreement not to violate sanctions, so for them to do business with Skycom based on Meng's assurances was like a pretty serious issue for, for, for the bank. And, and, you know, the documents make it clear that the, they portrayed as the banks were sort of victims of, of this. They don't accuse the banks of, they say they may have violated sanctions, but it was because of what the assurances they received from Huawei that, that it didn't own Skycom. Now, Again, as, as far as I know, all Huawei has said about Meng's case so far is that it doesn't, wasn't given much information about it and that it's not aware of any wrongdoing by her. Um, so what does Mr. Plummer have to say about all this? Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to wait for the sequel to his book, and I, I for one, can't wait. But, but interestingly, though, his book, which was self-published last June, before, before this whole thing, he does make mention of my 2013 story about Ms. Meng and her ties to Skycom. And what we learned from it is that in April 2016, Huawei received a subpoena from the Commerce Department that had begun investigating the company. Now again, think about that. This is like before the U.S. election and, and all that stuff. So the, suddenly the U.S. government has you know, after looking for several years at ZTE, turns its attention to Huawei. And so why is that? And it turns out that, that one of the things they, the U.S. Got, government got hold of was, was an internal ZTE document that described in elaborate detail um, how it circumvented sanctions. And it wasn't just Iran, by the way. It was also North Korea, and I, I think it was Cuba. And, you know, and they s set up a series of front companies to do this. And in one of the documents, it says that they used a model from a rival company. 
and the description of the, which it called F7. It didn't name the company, it just said it was F7. But then it quickly became apparent that F7 was Huawei. So, which makes sense. There aren't that many of these, these companies. You know, in this, I, I, I know that, you know, students may know Huawei best for its smartphones, but, um, you know, it, its major business is um, telephone, uh, mobile telephone networking equipment. Uh, and the companies in that field basically consist of Nokia, Ericsson, um, Huawei, ZTE, and, and to, to a smaller extent, but a growing extent, Samsung. So it's not like there's a lot of companies in there. Anyway, so when news of this investigation by U.S. officials of Huawei emerge, Plummer says he, he wrote an email, he contacted his boss, and he wrote an email that he circulated within Huawei in which he reminds them about the story I did about Meng's ties to um, Skycom three years ago. This is what he writes. I received no response or reactions to the concerns I expressed and was effectively iced out of the loop going forward. And then he also says that he thinks his warning was one of the reasons Huawei laid him off last April. Quote, I had touched on topics that were off limits, he wrote. 